Now, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you um, to the uh, Ruth Keeler Memorial Library. I very much appreciate the opportunity. And one thing I do want to emphasize, if anyone has any questions after the program or any issues concerning the book, they can reach out to me through the website, the website, thepekingexpress.com, you know, has a, has a chat, has a communication function, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about, uh, about the story. Um, but um, anyway, the, the book is about the China's great train robbery of 1923. It's something that um, was pretty much buried to history um, and has not been written about extensively. There was it been mentioned in, in, in bits and pieces in, in different articles in, um, in, um, in biographies for some of the people that were involved. But overall, nobody has ever really uh, put the whole story together. And that's something that I, I tried to do. Um, the way it came about in, in preparing the, the, the book is, is I it came across this in other research projects that I had and started reading more and more about it and then um, tracked down a number of the family members. And that was that was the that was a source of information that really helped me understand what happened on the ground, you know, day by day during the, you know, the six week um, hostage crisis. The, the family records were just phenomenal. In fact, what I was able to find was like one, one gentleman took a, a prepared 175 page diary of the entire event day by day. And it really helped put me in the, in the, in, in the perspective of, of sitting in the bandit camps along with the bandits. And so he describes in detail um, all of the, all of the uh, both the hostages as well as the bandits. And some of the things that I discovered in the files was just amazing. You know, as an example, yeah, the, the one of the key characters, his name is Roy Anderson. Um, he was the gentleman that negotiated the deal with the bandits. Um, Roy Anderson's grandniece lives in Western Massachusetts. And in her files is the original agreement between Roy Anderson and the bandits. You know, wow. so I mean, so the point is, is that the family records were just phenomenal um, as a writer, as a researcher in um, in preparing the story. And so and I found, I mean, photographs, the photographs that are on both this PowerPoint as well as in the book um, are those that came from the family records. So the key for me, the decision to write the book actually came when I was digging through the family records and then actually talking to the children and the grandchildren of the hostages and then the stories that they told that they heard from their parents and from their grandfathers about what happened really helped give me a perspective that I was able to write the book for everyone, you know, not just for from the perspective of the, the hostages, but also from the perspective of the rescuers and the bandits themselves. <clears throat> and so, and I've spent a lot of time in China, in southern China, excuse me, southern Shandong, where all of this took place, and was able to talk to. Um, I actually went to a big banquet two months ago with the the grand nephew for the bandit chief Sun Miao, and got all and it's got a lot of insights about about uh, what the perception was for his uncle. But anyway. So having spent a lot of time in China, I was able to write the story and it's um, designed it in a way that is, covers the perspectives of everyone that was involved. Now, I'm not going to I'm going to get go into some detail about the story, but without uh, because some people have not read it. I don't want to spoil the ending because the ending uh, is climatic and something that, um, you know, it doesn't end well for some people. You know, so I'm leaving that bit of surprise for those that um, have not have not read the book. But anyway, um, what it is, it's a story about um, 1923, which was not a great time for China. It was very chaotic, very chaotic because you had these warlords that were fighting one another. You know, every province, every city, there was a warlord that was in control of the, the region. And they were all fighting one another. And what happened is when one warlord succeeded over another warlord, 
you would have all of these armed men, you know, bad, disbanded soldiers that were basically that ran off into the countryside. And then inevitably, a lot of them became bandits because they were they were not paid. They were not disarmed. You know, so the warlord era was really was really terrible in the way they was not just fighting one another, but they were not addressing the fact that they had all these armies. You know, every warlord had their own army. And as they fought one another, they just disbanded the, each other's armies. And that just created a huge pool of men that were roaming the countryside, men and young boys roaming the countryside looking for trouble. And this was an ex existential threat, you know, to the Chinese government. In the meantime, you know, the Chinese government was trying to unify the country. Uh, because you had all these warlord factions fighting one another. One of the goals after the fall of the Qing, which was in 1911, 1912, was that the Republican government was trying to unify the country. And one of the ways they thought to do that was the building of the railroads. Now, um, in backing up, China was very, very slow to warm up his, uh, the idea um, of the railroads. The first railroad in China was in 1876, and that was a nine mile line between Shanghai and the port of Wusong. It lasted for one year. You know, the, China, the Qing government at the time was not happy about the railroad. They thought that this was something that was interfering with the canal boat operators, with the farmers. And so after one year, they dug up the nine mile train line and dumped it in the ocean. You know. Fast forward to 1900, after the Boxer Rebellion, the government started thinking that maybe we should warm up to the idea of, of the railroad just to unify the country. You know, in 1900, it was only 10 miles of track in China. In the United States, in comparison, the U.S. had 193,000 miles of train track crisscrossing the U.S., servicing pretty much every pioneer town across the U.S., North America, going through Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And so the railroad was a big deal in the U.S. It was a big deal in Europe. But China had 10 mile of track, you know, and it was not just behind in the times. He was really, really in another world. And so the government started to think that it needed to modernize and so that they focused on, on you know, developing the railroad. And they put started putting a lot of whatever money they had, but they also invited foreign governments, foreign bankers to come in and start to build railroads throughout the country. By 1923, they had about 5,000 miles of track. All right, and they had started what was called the express service from Shanghai to Peking. All right, before they built that express service, it took five days to go from Shanghai to Peking by ocean going vessel because China did not really have roads. The roads were basically impassable. And so having this express train was a huge deal, not just because it was to unify the country, but it was also to drive commerce, to drive trade, to drive tourism, you know? And then the government also put a lot of money into the railway cars and the railway cars in the express trains were from the United States. And these were basically all steel construction train, train cars, passenger cars. Now the difference between steel and wood is a big deal because even in the US it was they were they were getting away with the wood cars because wood cars in a collision would lead to fires as well as what's called telescoping where you have one train car on top of another you know, that would, um, and then would collapse and the fatality rate was extremely high. So China wanted to be at the top of the game. And so they invested in these all steel construction, you know, carriages. And not only were they, you know, um, advertised as being safe you know, because they were all steel, but they were also bulletproof. And they were really bulletproof and they were advertised the Chinese, you know, railroad advertised these cars as being safe for travel through bandit-ridden country. So 
uh, I mean, a train going from Shanghai to Peking crossed through the center of the country, went through areas like um, like the Shandong province, which was where the bandits were, you know. So now just imagine yourself at the Shanghai Nanking railway station and you've got your kids, you've got your spouse and everyone's excited about taking the train. And then you overhear somebody across the room saying, hey, we're going through a bandit country. And, I, and you say, wait a minute, is this safe? And so you have with you what is called your handbook for China, which back in 1923 was the same thing as the Lonely Planet Guide. All right. So this was written by author Carl Crow. This is the 1921 edition. And Carl Crow in the Handbook for China has a whole section on banditry. And what does he say? He says, basically, all in all, travel on the regular routes is, uh, is as safe in China as in any other part of the world. Robbers and pirates exist, of course, and there is usually a revolution or rebellion going on in some part of the country. But these things add zest rather than danger to your journey. So as you're preparing the board to train, this is what you're reading and you're pretty excited. You're not worried about your family. And that's what the you know 300 passengers on the train were reading as they were preparing you know, to get on board. So who was on this train? You know, you imagine yourself at the train station and there's 300 people getting ready to board the train. And you see, you see tourists uh, from around the world, including um, two U.S. Army majors. There's a photo of one here at the top with the children. Uh, the Army majors were stationed in Manila at the Army bases in Manila, which at the time was a U.S. possession following the Spanish-American War. And like typical expats, you know, they thought that they were going to do a trip, a holiday to China. So you had in that crowd, you had you had women, you had children, you had families that were tourists. You had honeymooners. You had honeymooners from Mexico. You had a leading lawyer, Musso, Chidi Musso, a photo of him is at the top to the left. Chidi Musso was a kind of a very, uh, very well-known lawyer who actually represented some kind of shady clients. He represented gun runners, he represented warlords, he represented drug, you know, drug uh, importers. And he also represented the, opa, uh, excuse me, the opium combined, which is the monopoly that ran the opium trade in China. And so Musso had all these kind of strange clients and he was on the train. You also had a very large pool of the uh, the Jewish merchants community. There was eight members of the Jewish merchants community that were boarding the train. Now at the time, you know, there was a, the, the Jewish merchants are the ones that were driving the construction and the development in Shanghai. And so you have uh, from both the um, Sephardi Jews as well as the Ashkenazi Jews that were that were very uh, that were um, uh, living and working in Shanghai that were also on the train. You know there was questions that came up about well there was so many Jews that became hostage in the crisis. Um, did the Chinese bandits target them? No. It was more of a reflection of the diversity the diversity of the people that were living and working in Shanghai at the time. So you had a, just a real broad group of people. And one of, the, one of the most interesting characters at the train station, Nanking, at the Shanghai Nanking train station, was this lady wearing a very broad Easter bonnet-like hat. There's a photo of her here. And that was Lucy Aldrich. And Lucy Aldrich was the sister-in-law of John D. Rockefeller Jr. And she was on her second circumnavigation of the globe. And in China, she was on her way to Beijing and Peking to continue to buy um, antiques and exotic fabrics. Um, she was a huge collector of antiques. Now, she was also very well connected politically. Her, her father was the former um, Senator from um, Rhode Island. 
Her brother was a sitting congressman from Rhode Island, in addition to being connected to the Rockefeller family. So she was there. So you had all these very, very interesting characters. Um, and a lot of these folks wrote about their experiences, and which is reflected in the book. Now, <clears throat> in addition to the bandits, you have, excuse me, in addition to the, the passengers that actually became hostages, you also had a lot of very interesting bandits. Now, the bandits um, were not just disbanded soldiers, but they were also people from a lot of different walks of life that were just looking to make a living. You know, some bandits were, you know, the typical thieves, but most of them were just uh, people that were looking for work. You know, in addition to the disbanded soldiers, there were several veterans of what is called the China Labor Corps, and they were Chinese men um, that went to, to Europe as contract laborers during World War I. And Shandong province was a big area for recruitment of the China Labor Corps. And there was almost 200,000 Chinese men that went to serve in Europe. And basically what they did in Europe was dig trenches and bury bodies. And so, and those that worked in the China Labor Corps, most of them returned to China. Some of them did not have jobs. And so unfortunately they, um, they were basically forced to join the bandit, uh, the bandit um, armies. Now, a lot of them that were in the China Labor Corps were actually the more sophisticated bandits because not only did they have experience with, you know, sophisticated machinery, you know, to dig the trenches, but they also had um, experience with a modern weaponry, weaponry, and then also they spoke multiple continental languages. English and French and German and so forth. And so they came back to China when they're very, very sophisticated. And they're the ones that actually communicated with the with a lot of the hostages, especially if they were able to speak English, uh, French or, or German. You know, but so this bandit army was a very, very sophisticated group, you know, and um, um so. It, you know, you had just a very interesting group of the, of the passengers, but then also the bandits. Now, the bad guys in the whole story are the warlords. The warlords were highly corrupt individuals. Even the warlord armies were corrupt because they were selling their ammunition to the bandits themselves. You know, so the, the warlords were the ones that were coming in and trying to wipe out the bandit army. Or see, and, and that was one of the catalysts for the Peking Express holdup. You know, the, the warlord in Shandong province was trying to stop the bandit army chief Sun Miao from basically, you know, going back to his home, trying to work in his hometown. You know, the bandit, the warlord uh, declared, the warlord declared war on Sun Miao. It started wiping out village after village in southern Shandong. And the, the final straw for Sun Miao, the bandit chief, was when the warlord assassinated his brother. His brother was not a soldier, his brother was a scholar. You know, and basically the warlord had his brother, you know, decapitated and hung his brother's head, you know, at the gate of the train station in southern Shandong. And that was the final straw. And that's when Sun Miao declared war. He declared war on the warlords. Now, the, the motivation for the bandits was not economic. Sun Miao and his bandits army was not looking for ransom money. They were not looking for um, an, an economic, this was not an economic issue. This was really political, it was social. And what they wanted was first and foremost for the warlords out of southern Shandong. And secondly, Sun Miao wanted him and his army to be in control, to be, in, to be recognized by the central government as a controlling army, as a police force in the southern Shandong area. So the agenda was more, was more political, more social. And so what Sun Miao did after his brother was murdered he made a decision that he was going to hold up the Peking Express. Um, what he did was he had his spies, you know, 
could contact the train and the people that were working on the train. And what he learned was that the, the railway guard on the night of the holdup, the railway guards that are that are lining the track were not working. Part of it was because the leader of the railway police had his birthday up in Tianjin, and all the every all the leaders of the railway police were gone. So the train line was was unattended, was unguarded, and this was because Sun Miao basically figured this out. And so then he, what he did was he decided to hold up the train. You know the the number two express train traveling up through the countryside at two forty in the morning, and what he did, how he did it was he had his men remove the fish plates from the train. You know, back in back in nineteen twenty three, the rail technology was held together by a steel plate with multiple bolts. You know, and by removing the fish plates and by taking up the rail, the railroad um, spikes, the rails themselves would still be on the track, but the the weight of the train when it crosses the point where the fish plates were removed could not hold up the rails. And so Sumiao had his men remove 16 um, fish plates. And so the rails were just basically loose. Now, when the conductor was, was, um, was driving the train, northward this the location of this was on a, actually on a curve and so with the headlight he could not see with the headlight that anything was going wrong with the track the track itself was still stationary but because it was on a curve he slowed the train down the train typically a locomotive like this would be going about 35 40 miles an hour but he slowed it down because of the curve he slowed it down to about 10 miles an hour so when it hit that spot, basically the locomotive sank into the embankment and because it could not break the cars behind it. As you can see from the photograph, they fishtailed behind the train. And now the car that you see um, that is derailed is actually the mail car. The car behind that is the, is the, the third class car. Now the bandits ignored the third class passengers and focused on the first and second class passengers. What the what they wanted was to seize, you know, as hostages those that were in the first or second class. They figured the third class had no political value, and so they focused on the foreign as well as the uh, as well as the high wealth Chinese passengers. They took twenty eight foreigners from multiple countries, and then about seventy five Chinese. And from that point, you know, this was done at you know two forty in the morning. You know, by 5.30 in the morning, they were trekking across the countryside. So the, the band had started moving across the countryside with the hostages, you know. And now the, when they, the train was derailed, they went in three waves. There was a thousand bandits. The, the bandit army consisted of a thousand uh, men. And they set upon the, the train in three waves. The first wave that came on was it that they, they took the watches, the jewelry, the coins, the money, and so forth. And they did that, not for economic reasons, but they needed to buy ammunition from the Chinese army, the corrupt Chinese army. So the first wave came in to get the valuables. The second wave, the second wave came in and took the fixtures off the train, took the blankets, the lighting fixtures, the pots and pans, and anything that they could use to barter with the villages because they needed to barter with the villages as they went from village to village to village as they were making their way up to their bandit headquarters. So this was a trek. They were trekking a total of over 30 miles across the countryside. You know, so the, when they um, came onto the train, they first took the valuables, the second they took the fixtures, and then the third wave, they took hostages. And the hostages again were 28 foreigners, and then they also took about 75 Chinese and then started racing across the countryside. Immediately after this happened, the, um, you know, the various foreign governments involved, as well as the Chinese government started to, you know, negotiate with the bandits and they, they created a headquarters down in Southern Shandong. Um, and in the, there were the countries that were represented 
with Italian, French, British, and American, because they're the ones that primarily had, you know, um, the head hostages. There was also a Mexican hostage, but the Mexican government did not send a representative because they were represented by the U.S. Um, there was other, some hostages escaped, including one that was from a Danish hostage, a German hostage. They escaped into the countryside. Now, what they did was, is they, they created a rescue operation um, because this thing went on, you know, this went on for uh, over five weeks and, you know, they, they had to make sure people were fed and so forth. And so they, there was a lot of these rescue schemers, fixers and diplomats diplomats that converged on the area. And that created a lot of po political intrigue that went, uh, that took place during the negotiation. Now, did the Chinese government negotiate a deal? No, they tried. The Chinese government and the bandits did not get along. Who ended up negotiating the deal was an American fixer by the name of Roy Anderson, whose picture's here in the, on the, the slide. So, um, now, in addition to all of the, um, the government officials on site is you had a lot of correspondence. All right, now the correspondents were also hostages. So you had hostages that ended up being, that were correspondents and they were actually writing stories while they were in the bandit camp. You know, there was also, there was also correspondents that escaped. And they were able to write about their uh, write about their exploits as they went across the countryside. You know, the the reporters, the correspondents on site, were actually the ones that got the message out to the world before the actual governments did. And in the case in point on that was John D. Rockefeller Jr. himself was tending his garden. Um, on the morning of May 6th, 1923, he was tending his garden in his summer home in, in um, Seal Harbor, Maine. And an Associated Press reporter approached him in the garden and sa asked him if he had comments about the fact that his sister-in-law, Lucy Aldrich, had been captured by bandits in China. John D. Rockefeller's reaction was, that's nonsense. You know, I'm, you know, I have through my company Standard Oil, I have offices all over China. If something happened to my sister-in-law, Lucy Aldrich, I would have heard about it. I would have known about it. No, so the Associated Press reporter was the one that broke the news to Rockefeller. Then Rockefeller himself called up the Secretary of State and asked the Secretary of State, what was going on in China? Secretary of State says, I have no idea. It was that Rockefeller broke the news to the Secretary of State from what the word he got from the Associated Press reporter. And it was the Secretary of State that panicked and started contacting the, the, the embassy and the consulates to try to figure out what was going on. And what he found out immediately was, yes, indeed, Lucy Aldridge is a hostage by the bandits somewhere in the Chinese countryside. So it's a pretty remarkable that the, there was the foreign correspondence that got the word out worldwide. And this was, of course, before the day and age of the of satellites, of the Internet and so forth. What they had to do is get the word out by way of telegram. And even Chinese government was trying to keep them from getting the word out and try to prevent it and interfered with that. But what the reporters did was send runners um, down to Peking or up to Beijing to send out the telegrams for their stories. But for that the 37 day crisis, it was on the front cover of newspapers around the world. And not just buried on page five, but at the top of the fold on the front and cover of newspapers from around the world. And the correspondents that were both hostage as well as those that escaped or on site um, are given credit for driving the story and getting the word out around the world. Now, this ended up being a hostage crisis and the bandits basically drove the hostages to what is called Patsuku Mountain 
now, um, which is actually a very, very beautiful area. It's now in a in national forest in China. Um, and this is a photo, I've been there 10 times. It's a really cool location. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed much from 1923. And during the crisis, most of the hostages were kept at the foothills in a Taoist temple at the foothills of Patsuko Mountain. And that Taoist temple has been around for 1200 years and has not changed since 1923. In fact, the very same ginkgo tree that was there in 1923, it was actually, it's a 900 it's a year old tree. It's still there in the temple compound. And it was the same tree that the hostages slept under in the temple compound. At the top of this mountain, um, they, they put three American hostages. And part of the reason they did that was because the Chinese army had encircled this mountain you know, and basically we're firing on the on the on the bandits, and so the hot uh, the bandits actually separated some of the hostages, and so three Americans, the two army majors and one American businessman, were brought to the top of Pazuku Mountain, and they were there while negotiations went on. But um, into, so just so you know, at the the 100th anniversary of the event, which was on May 5th, 6th, and 7th. Um, I was in Shandong province and we went to, with the government, the actual, the government sponsored the whole event. And we, we had a banquet with the uh, grand nephew for Sun Miao, but also we climbed with a group of reporters. I brought 12 reporters to the top of the mountain. When I got to the Pazuku mountain, there's actually a cable car and you can barely see it. It's off to the right. Um, the cable car on that day wasn't working. And so we actually had to climb up to the top of the mountain. And that's 94 stories climb, you know. And so I, we did that on, this, this, you know, back on May 6th and 7th. But anyway, um, so anyway, the crisis, the, the, the hostages ultimately went to what is called Patsuku Mountain, which was their mountain stronghold. And it ended up being a 37-day crisis. Um, and then here's some photos from you know, the, from the temple at the top of, uh, at, the, at the top of, uh, at the foothills of Pautuku Mountain. Now, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to give, give away. Obviously, there was a resolution and the, the hostages were released, but what happened after, after that did not end well for certain people. Um, and so that's something that is covered in the book. But um, this, the whole incident was actually buried in history, except that Hollywood picked up on this. And uh, in the, what's called the Shanghai Express, it was a film in 1932. And if you have a chance to see it, it's worth seeing. However, the facts are very, very different from the Peking Express. Um, the way this came up was that the screenwriter, his name is Harry Herbie, a very well-known screenwriter. In 1923, Harry Hervey was a cruise ship director in a, on a boat in Asia when all of this was taking place. And like everyone else, you know, in 1923, he was just enthralled by the day-to-day -day coverage he was reading about the Peking Express story and came up with the idea for the screenplay, which ultimately became the 1932 Shanghai Express, which was nominated for Best Picture and several other awards. It ultimately got the Best Picture, excuse me, it got the, um, the Oscar for, um, for cinematography. Um, now, you know, the, the famous line in this movie by Marlena Dietrich when she said, it took more than one man to change my name to Shanghai Lily was never attributed to anybody in the real story. And also in the movie, they don't leave the train. They stay on the train pretty much the whole time. You know, there's no trek to the mountainside. In fact, there was um, um, Jonathan Spence, a very well-known um, China expert in reviewing the movie. He basically said the real story is more exciting than the movie. 
But anyway, I would recommend you see it just because there are certain things about it that can give you some ideas uh, about the overall story. But anyway, that kind of concludes my um, comments. So I'm welcome questions. If you can put them in the chat function, you know, only th that may help us out in getting the questions. If you have any questions or thoughts, I'm happy to answer the questions. Now, just one thing while people are typing questions is, as I mentioned, the weekend of May, May 5th, 6th and 7th, I was in Shandong. It was my 10th time to the top of the mountain. And the I can tell you that the, the, the Chinese government has embraced the story, which is kind of an interesting thing. And they actually issued a first day a stamp, the first stamp, an envelope. And you can see this is the mountain here. But this was issued on May 6th you know, when I was in Shandong province, but the government itself has now embraced the whole story. And part of that is part of the side story in the book was the creation of these bedded post stamps. And that was the, what facilitated a lot of the communication between the band, the, between the hostages and the, the rescuers. But this was, this is a reflection of how the, the government, the Chinese government has embraced the story. Now, Question may be, is the book sold in China? Um, it is. The English version is slowly getting into the market. Um, originally, when the book, the book was released um, in April of, of this year, the Chinese government banned the book because it was political history. And so automatically they get banned. Having said that, though, the importer now has brought the book in based on characterizing it as science and technology. You know, so trained science. All right, so where there's a will, there's a way. So the book is now sold in China, but because of its limited number of basically imports into the market, you know, the, the price is off the charts. It's now, um, you can buy used copy online in China for the equivalent of about, of about $150, which is ridiculous. And I tell people don't buy it for that much. I'll lend you my copy before I, I want people to, to be buying it for that price. But now the Chinese version, I'm working on that. And so hopefully by the, the end of this year, the Chinese version will be um, will also be sold. Um, so anyway, we're getting some questions. Um, the question is, Soon's control of bandits, more than 1,000, with few exceptions, seems to be extraordinarily uh, extraordinary initially. Was this the same after the agreement with Chung, or were there concocted issues leading to his execution? Um, without you know spoiling all of this, um, yeah, they actually two things: the the bandit ranks swelled from 1,000 to 2,800. And part of that was that, you know, there was bandits from across the countryside in different provinces that were coming in to join the bandit M army. And they ultimately, they ended up um, integrating into the new brigade, brigade a total of 2,800. Um, and so this was a, a part of the agreement that was reached to, um, you know, with to create the new brigade. Um, but um, he, he was limited to 1,000. Part of that was because he only had, initially, Sun Miao only had 700 men, but his co-chief, Popo Lu, had 300 men. You know, but the numbers did indeed swell. And then eventually, you know, Sun Miao was tricked in the end. And he was, um, you know, as it would be, as you will read in the book, his things did not end well for some, including Sun Miao. Questions, comments? Um, that's a good question. The question here is, I have not read the book yet. Did the bandits become heroes in, uh, to some in society? That's an excellent question. Okay. Now, in, Ch in China, the, they actually, over the, since 1923, there was a lot of discussions about whether Sun Miao was a hero. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, especially, there was a lot of discussions and it was the, it was the, um, 
the Institute of Military Sciences that did an analysis and they said that he was not a hero. Now, having said that, I can tell you that Sun Miao's position in society has improved. Yeah, calling somebody a hero in China is a big deal. It's basically, it, it puts them up way at the top, you know, and I don't think the Chinese government, the party is willing to make him a hero, but they do want to recognize his efforts and they've done that. Now, when I was in Shandong, May 6th and 7th, and I was at this banquet with the grand nephew for Su Miao. You know, it was kind of fun because there was 20 people at the banquet. There was three government officials there from the local Shandong government um, that were that were at the banquet. And I was basically interviewing the grand nephew and asking him questions about what he heard in his family about his uh, about his his um, his his great uncle. And he, the things he said were, he goes, he was a man of the people, he was highly educated, he was well respected, all of these great things about his uncle. And then I asked him, do you consider your uncle to be a hero? Now, the moment I used that, the word hero, he stopped. And then the three government officials basically were backed off and you could see the reaction the reaction from the government officials was, don't go there, you know, because you know, labeling Su Miao a hero is not the official line. Sure, we can get, say that he's a man of the people. We can say that he was someone that um, was highly educated and so forth, uh, but he's not a hero under party standards. You know, so now I think what you're finding locally, because when I first went to start in to Palzuko in 2015, I talked to a lot of the locals and basically they didn't want to talk about the banners. You know, they didn't want to they didn't want to associate. But today, more and more people want to say they want to use their the, the fact that, yeah, my I, uh, my family comes from banded stock. So it's more it's more of a story you can talk about than you could even in 2015, you know. And even at Pazuko Mountain, they have um, they have put up some um, some monuments, you know, that talk about the whole story. Back in 2015, there was no mention of bandits. In fact, I put that in the book at the end. There's no mention of bandits, but now 2023, they're starting to talk about it. So yeah. I think you're going to find slowly that Sun Miao, he may not reach a level of being earmarked as a hero, but he's going to be treat, treated locally with respect, you know, and pretty much is going to be silently a hero to a lot of those people that are just fighting for justice. And because I think that's what he represents. He was fighting for justice in his own way. Um, next question. The Americans at the top of the mountain, did they have food and protection in the elements? Yes and no. There was actually the, um, what is called the American Rescue Mission, which was run by, you know, Carl Crow himself, who who actually, he was the, the local, uh, the Shanghai chair of the American Red Cross. And so he basically set up the rescue mission. They were sending provisions up there on what is called the Cooley Express, it's not a politically correct term, but that was what it was used. And then, um, and they were sending up every single day provisions, food, bottled water, um, cots, tents, so forth. Um, the tents were not used. They decided at the top, they were gonna to sleep in what are, uh, the, there's traditional structures at the top called dugouts, which were um, actually better than the tents. You know, so there was they were protected from the elements. One of the bigger issues for them was making sure that they had, you know, clean bottled water. And so the the one of the photos you saw earlier um, had a photo of the Cooley Express, and those poor guys basically had to carry up the mountain. Um, let me show it to you. Yeah, this the the middle photo. They had to carry up the mountain the bottled water and everything. 
And that was just a phenomenal, phenomenal task because from this location, it was 12 miles one way, round trip 24 miles. So these poor guys were working, carrying provisions, bottled water, mail, and so forth up to the, the bandit camps. All right, so, but yeah, uh, next question. I listened to the audiobook, so I am really enjoyed the um, I, I enjoyed the photos. It was hard to imagine what those riding chairs looked like, or the size of those mountains, and what the climbs were like. All quite unbelievable. What a story! Thank you. Yeah, this is a this is a, the Dan chair. So when this guy negotiating, this is Roy Anderson. When he would go up to the bandit camp, he was basically carrying, you know, um, and he he really um, you know he didn't walk. You know, but the other people walk. In fact, in the story itself, several the army majors walk back. You know, they didn't want to use the sedan chairs. Now, I'm I'm going to send to Carolyn a link that you can distribute to everybody on the call here. And there is a very short two minute film from 1923 that you might enjoy of the day that they were released. It's only two minutes long. It's on YouTube. But it's a film that was taken on June 12, uh, 1923. And I'll send you the link and then you can circulate that to anybody on there. But you can <coughs> see, you would see the sedan chairs in action and you can actually see them coming down the mountain. Um, and some of those actually, it was uh, what is called the Shanghai cousin, the Jewish cousins actually rode horses down, you know. So, but and it's, it's worth seeing. So I'll send that to you. Oh, Next thank question. you. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. How much of the facts events uh, here do you think influence subsequent hostage events even to the present? Good question. Um, so overall story just to me demonstrates that hostage diplomacy is alive and well, and not just in China, but in a lot of places around the world. And it's a very, very unfortunate, but I do not think that the events here had much influence other than, at least with the Chinese side, they took the view that the foreigners were too demanding, that the foreign governments were too demanding, and basically that they should have just backed off and allowed you know, the, the warlord army to crush the bandits from day one. Unfortunately, that would have put the hostages at risk. You know, so I don't think a whole lot has been learned you know, or influenced by the events. But there are, in making some comparisons, and I do mention this at the end of the book, there are a lot of things in 1923 that have not been corrected in the 2023. And that's, that's an issue. So, okay. Did anything change with the train transportation system as a result of this event? Good question. Um, the train system, the express train system never really recover. Um, this unfortunately um, really, uh, you know, consumers in general, you know, business people in general thought twice about travel. You know, there was a lot of assurances about, you know, and they put more guards on the train. They added more train guards and um, uh, it never recovered as, as much as they wanted it to. Having said that, just a few years later, 1932, the Japanese invaded, and in 1932, 1937, Southern Shandong, you know, was the location of a lot of, a lot of wars, a lot of battles, including in Linchang, including the specific railroad was blown up several times. So, um, one thing that happened too is a lot of the foreign um, business associations, like the American Chamber and the European groups, were calling upon foreign governments to take over the railroads. And that's something that didn't sit well with the Chinese government is that the, the foreign businesses were trying to say China can't govern itself. And that's something that's a problem. Um, and then it's, um, but the US and the British refused to take over the train. They figured this was China's problem and China really needed to deal with this. Um, what happened to the children hostages at the top of the mountain? That's a good question. They were eventually released, um, both the children as well as the other Chinese hostages that remained, you know, captive. 
and they were released um, about about seven weeks after you know the the foreigners were released. The children hostages, unfortunately, um, the some of them were have been detained for so long they were not able to track down their parents, and so those that could not you know be returned to their parents actually were sent to the the missions, the Christian missions like the Presbyterian mission or the Catholic mission in southern Shandong, and, and basically became orphans. But the, the release of the children was really driven by once the foreign hostages were released, they started a media campaign to force the Chinese government to get them off the mountain. It was a very a horrible, horrible situation um, and something that is a real black mark on China at the time is the, the situation involving those children that were hostage at the same time you had foreign hostages. Um, good question. How did this event break the Republic? Uh, does this story factor into the coming struggle between the communists and the Nationalists in any way? Yeah, the two things, two things that happened. The first of which is, you know, the, the government at the time, um, President Lee, who took office just about seven months before the incident, he was brought back into office for a second time. President Lee was viewed as a reformer. He was almost like a savior to China because he wanted to he wanted to have a constitution. He wanted to unify the country. He wanted to do with the warlord system. He was a reformist, you know, um, and he, they saw um, even the foreign government saw President Lee as someone that was going to bring China down a path of reform. Unfortunately, the day the hostages were released, President Lee was forced out of office. And basically, it was a coup that was done by warlords uh, by the name of Cao Kun. So Lee was pushed out of office. On top of that, which is a, a bigger issue, was what is called extraterritoriality. Um, this is an issue that was negotiated during the, the opium wars under what is called the unequal treaties. Extraterritorial privileges was something negotiated by the foreign governments and imposed on China. What it did was it allowed the foreign governments to set up their own court systems, um, and then it made foreign citizens, U.S. citizens, U.K. citizens, um, immune from Chinese law, Chinese taxation, and so forth. Now, in 1923, the Chinese government had basically had requested that the, the global, the foreign governments to do away with extraterritoriality. And this was a big deal because they viewed extraterritorial privileges as a, as a, a violation of China's sovereignty and as something that was very, very insulting to the Chinese. You know, and so um, in November of 1923, they had scheduled a commission that was going to meet and that they were going to set up a plan to do away with extraterritoriality. Unfortunately, because of the Peking Express, the, uh, because of this incident, they postponed. The foreign governments refused to give up extraterritoriality. They basically, the message to the Republican government was, is you can't govern your, you cannot govern your, your country, you cannot control your country, and we're not giving up extraterritoriality. So our court systems are going to stay. You know, most people don't realize it, but the United States had its own court in China. It was called the United States Court for China. The British had their own court system. You know, so because of the Lin Chung incident, they were, would not give this up. It wasn't until World War II, over 20 years later, that extraterritoriality was given up. Now, what this really meant was it had it weakened the Republican government. It really, really weakened the Republican government. And it was something that was a sore spot because they were basically told that they could not govern their own country. By weakening the Republican government, it also strengthened Mao and the Communist Party. In 1923, the party was young. 
Yeah, Mao himself brought up the Lin Chung incident two years after he brought it up in a speech to the Hunan um, People's Congress. You know, so this whole incident, the Lin Chung incident, strengthened the Communist Party. It weakened the Republican government specifically because one, President Lee was cast out of office. And secondly, the issue of extraterritoriality was not resolved in 1923. So it did, in some respect, break the Republic of China, as well as to strengthen the Communist Party because their mantra going forward was, we need to get the imperialists out of China. We need to take China back you know, from the, the, the colonial powers. And extraterritoriality was a remnant from the colonial days. It was a remnant from the unequal treaties following the Opium Wars. Um, next question. Do you think the Chinese cultural idea of saving face to the international community was constantly consciously exploited by those negotiating to release the foreign hostages or was it just incidentally lucky for the foreign hostages and interests? I think, I think you know, saving face is clearly a factor. I mean, you know, in all of negotiations, you know, they needed to allow the, the bandits to save face. They needed to allow the warlords to save face. In the book, one of the famous quotes from General Chung was, everybody has lost faith. The bandits have lost face, the warlords have lost face, the Chinese armies have lost face, the hostages, the foreign government, everybody has lost face. And he says, let's do away with face and let's, let's negotiate. You know, so it was definitely something that was on the minds of everyone, but it also on the minds of the international community. But I think the, there's elements within the international community that is less sensitive to the saving face concept. I think Roy Anderson, <clears throat> he understood what saving face was all about. And that's why in the deal that was negotiated and, and the process for reaching that deal and all of the speeches that went into at the time they negotiated was about saving face. So yeah, it's something that definitely was um, you know, something was on everyone's minds and it was used. Um, and then even, even the Peking government realized that the bandits um, were not going to negotiate with the war, whoever the government sent, either the Shandong government, the provincial government, or the central government, that the, you know, the tension, the trust deficit between the two sides was not going was, was not going to allow them to negotiate a deal. And bringing in Roy Anderson was really designed to save face. And to, because part of it too was the bandits wanted security. They wanted a guarantee and they could not trust the Chinese government to give them the guarantee. The foreign governments were not gonna give them a guarantee. And so the save, the, the, the guarantee, you know, was something that came by way of Roy Anderson you know, um, and whether it worked or not is, is something left for history. But anyway, saving face is something that is always on the mind or was on the minds back in 1923 as it is today. It's a very, very important concept in society. Um, and no matter who is politically in control, either under the Republican government or under the communist government, saving face is very, very important. Was the world press sympathetic to the bandits' cause? Um, I am in, initially, um, yes and no. At times, there were stories that showed some sympathy. There were stories that wrote about Sun Miao and who he was. Um, um, there was not a lot of sympathy at the fact that people were, were murdered. Um, and there was towards the end, as this thing dragged on and on and on for 37 days, the bandits, you know, there was less sympathy for the bandits. In fact, you know, one of, you know, Roy Anderson's, uh, Roy Anderson's message to the bandits was, you're losing, you're really losing the, the viewpoint or the, uh, the, the support, whatever support you had from the international government. 
you're losing that as this thing goes on and on and on. You know, so let the, you know, let's let's work out a deal. And part of that too is the, you know, there were there were some female, you know, young teenage girls that were were held hostage and, and they were misused and abused by some of the bandits, but they were eventually they were released just from a PR perspective too, because it was like, look, you're losing the support of the foreign community or the foreign press by keeping these girls here, you know? So, but the world press was in some respects sensitive to the cause, the political, the social cause, you know, but they were more sympathetic to the whole, um, you know, the whole, you know, situation in the, in the rural communities. You see that in the writings too of the the hostages, even Lucy Aldridge. Lucy Aldridge's writings, she at first was very arrogant in the way she described the bandits and the and the way she described the villagers and so forth. But as she, as time went on, as she could see the way they lived and then the way that the villagers treated her, and they treated her with kindness you know, then she developed more empathy for them. And that's also, that's reflected in the world press as well. Questions, observations? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any more questions? Um, well, I had one last question, okay? And I'm not putting it in chat, but um, this, can you just tell quickly the story of Lucy Aldrich? without giving away the ending, you know, because that is one of the most captivating parts of the story. Well, she she was detained for about for <laughs> two and a half days. And basically um, all of the women in general were eventually released except for one woman. And that's a that's a side story. One of the 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 honeymooner, the Mexican uh, woman, she was held. She would not leave. She would not leave her husband. So, but the women and children were released. Um, and the last children to be released was after four days. Lucy Aldrich was basically abandoned, you know, because she was really slowing things down. And the bandits eventually, you know, they decided that she was moving too slow and she was effectively released. Um, and then she was let on her own. And her own adventure took place and she. Uh, ended up going to a village, um, and from there she made her way across the countryside to um, to be to be rescued effectively by some of the the the, the Americans that were waiting for her. Um, but she has a very interesting story, just because she was um, you know she was held hostage for two and a half days and eventually got out. But for the most part, she was she was the bandits basically gave up on her because she was going too slow. But she, um, for the most part, she was a little bit worried she would be taken hostage again, you know, when she was um, eventually released and tried to make her way across the countryside because there was one of the a friendly bandit tried to help her and she wasn't sure if she was being kept as a hostage or he was actually taking her to civilization, you know. So, but her story was pretty interesting in the way she was released. And also with respect to her jewelry and how she hid her jewelry um, in that jewelry was eventually found, you know, buried under a rock. And then her discussions with Sun Miao were very, very interesting. And that's part of her story. And I tried to talk about, um, you know, how she survived the, the 48 hours and, um, you know, and, and, you know, the conditions that she was under you know, where it's pretty extreme for somebody that's brought up in Providence, Maine, or excuse me, Providence, Rhode Island. So she was um, in her upbringing to have to sleep in a basically a doghouse is something that, you know, um, is something to read about. So it's very interesting. Her story is very, very interesting. After that, which was also interesting, after she made her way back to the U.S., she talked about her, she talked about her experiences quite a bit. And she went to, um, you know, um, so, but anyway, and then she also wrote about it. She wrote about it and was published in the Atlantic Monthly. But, but anyway, but Lucy Aldridge was a very, very interesting character. Did she ever help that village that saved her? 
did she help? Did she ever what? <clears throat> help the village that saved her, the peasants that saved her. Um, she, I never saw anything in her files that she went back uh, after after she left China. Um, they, you know, she did not go back there. She did not write to them, but she had talked about it. She, in in her writing, she had talked about doing something for them. But I, in her personal records, I could find no proof that she actually basically wrote them or sent them money or sent them things. Um, I do know that, you know, through Rockefeller's company, Sacconi, they basically went back to the villages, but not Lucy Aldridge. Thank you. Um, James, thank you so much. This has just been marvelous. I, I, I've enjoyed it thoroughly and I love listening. I listened to your book and I read parts of it. So thank you. And um, for, um, thank you everybody for coming in. And for those of you who are in the history book group or are interested in participating because it's open to anyone, the next book is Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom about the Taiping Rebellion in the middle of the 19th century. And we'll be meeting on Ju um, July 11th. So thank you very much. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in the United States and safe journey okay. back to Beijing. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. And then thank you to the, the Ruth Keeler Memorial Library. I really appreciate the opportunity. And feel free to visit the website and you can link up with me if you have any follow up questions or comments. And then I'll make sure I send you that that two minute film. Oh, yeah, thank YouTube you. That's you what I'd like to see. To people. Yeah. But I've been, and it's also going to be, uh, it should be posted on my Twitter account if anybody wants to follow that as well. But I, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. So Bye, Carolyn.